Today's book will be The Politics of Mourning by Mickey McElyay. Um, and she is a she is an associate professor of history at the University of Connecticut. Her previous book, Clinging to Mammy, examines the long-ranging impacts of slave iconography and the role that it plays it in modern American life. Her newest book, The Politics of Mourning, discusses Arlington National Cemetery and the political role it takes in shaping national identity. From its earliest era, when it was mostly seen as a memorial to white Civil War soldiers through World War I to Vietnam and beyond, Dr. <clears throat> Dr. McElyay shows us how the cemetery has long stood for America's ever-changing image of itself. And now, and now, please welcome Mickey McElyay. Thank you, Isaac, for that incredibly kind introduction. And I also would like to thank um, Candace from Politics and Prose. I have to say, it's a long time dream as an author to be standing here in this storied institution. So I am deeply appreciative of the opportunity and so thrilled that y'all made this possible. Um, I would also like to say thanks to my friends, some new friends who are here in the audience, and some very dear old friends whom I love a great deal and owe an enormous amount of thanks. And were with me as I wrote this book as well, so it's nice to have them with me here now. Um, and finally, I'd love to thank all of you who are here for sharing your time with me this afternoon. I'm particularly ha happy to talk about this book in this particular moment. Um, first, to be here around Veterans Day and to join in paying my respects to all who have served, um, something we should be mindful of all the time, not just on November 11th. And second, because in this week and after this campaign season and looking toward what is to come, I think we need to consider Arlington's history and its meanings for our present and future now more than ever before. I argue that taking it in the fullness of its story, in the fullness of Arlington's history, it is not only hallowed ground, but literally the United States' most common ground. And as we quest for common ground and spaces from which to understand our politics and our history, I urge everyone to look to Arlington's story um, and to consider its, its place in our politics over time. The book traces the history of the land from its days as a showcase Virginia plantation built by enslaved people for George Washington's adopted grandson up to the present moment. In 1831, all plan uh, the, the Arlington Plantation became home to Robert E. Lee when he married the first president's great granddaughter. Lee wrote his resignation from the US Army there in the great columned plantation house that still sits at the cemetery center, today a national memorial to the Confederate general. A strategic high ground above the Capitol, the plantation was occupied by federal forces within weeks of Lee's departure, some of, and some of the enslaved people that he and his family held in slavery um, remained and created new lives and freedom, seized in the conditions of war. They were joined by many more once enslaved people who had liberated themselves when the War Department made the occupied plantation site of a contraband camp called Freedman's Village. Along with the Army's stables and bivouac troops, it was the first significant federal use of the land, predating the cemetery by a year. The cemetery was established in 1864. In all of its uses, the former plantation was a microcosm for the fundamental reimagining of citizenship, the state, race, and nation that came with emancipation and reconstruction, as well as indicating the profound limits to that imagination. Racially segregated until Truman's executive order in 1948, that history is still clear on the landscape, particularly if one visits Section 27, containing the graves of thousands of black civilians and US colored troops, and once referred to as the Lower Cemetery. Over time, the interconnection of all of the plantation's uses and histories of the enslaved and their descendants were overshadowed by powerful narratives of white reconciliation and imperial fervor at the turn of the century, which also shaped the transformation of the cemetery itself from a pauper's field and local site um, to one among, and from one among many in the new national system 
to the country's most hallowed ground, to the National Cemetery of the United States. From the beginning, the cemetery was for the relocation of war dead from other places. Only, um, uh, only the, it only started to take on meaning and the gravitas that we think of it having today in the context of those, um, when those places were overseas. And repatriation was heralded as a definitive policy of the modern American state, as a cornerstone, actually, of American exceptionalism. With greater losses in the First World War and the creation of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in 1921, the cemetery's status as the most national and as the most sacred ground was secured. The origin of the Veterans Day holiday itself is here, dating to the end of the First World War and Armistice Day, November 11, 1919, which became the day of the tomb's dedication with the burial of the, the American unknown two years later. In his eulogy, then President Warren G. Harding a Republican who had won office promising a return to normalcy and a rejection of Woodrow Wilson's internationalism, described Arlington as the heart of the nation souring for its noble dead, positing a vast and varied population made into one body, sharing a heart through mourning and honoring the fallen. The ritual of the wreath laying at the tomb, official and otherwise, as much as by the average as by the elite and powerful, is a perpetual reenactment of the many become one at this place. Yet it is simultaneously a reminder of the profound limits to this vision of the country and the many barriers to unity and democracy embedded in these very traditions over time. When, Harle uh, when Harding described Arlington as the country's heart in 1921, the National Cemetery, like the armed forces it honors and the nation it represents, was racially segregated. Near the Potomac River, down the hill from Memorial Amphitheater, where Harding spoke that day, the old slave burial ground that the plantation had once been was still visible. And to an extent, it was still undisturbed. By World War II, those markers were gone, and the graves were covered over in the construction of temporary public housing called Arlington Farms Apartments for unmarried women who converged on Washington, D.C. for wartime civil service and military jobs. The armed forces, national capital, and the state of Virginia were all still legally segregated, as was the cemetery. The Arlington we know today that Kaiser Khan recently asked Americans to visit in order to witness the diversity of America's brave patriots, and thus to see the diversity of the nation itself, dates in many ways to the end of the Second World War and the start of the Cold War, as does President Obama's remarks at, veterans, um, at, uh, at the Veterans Day ceremony in Arlington on Friday, when he too urged us to recognize the diversity that's represented in this site, the diversity that's represented in the armed forces um, as a place to move forward and as a place to see commitments to American pluralism um, and to see a celebration of that diversity and, and the sacrifice there. What I would like to do at this point is share with you just a little bit from the book itself that is about this, um, this moment and about the end of the Second World War and the start of the Cold War and the ways in which Arlington is transformed in the process of being made hallowed ground over time into this site of pluralism and the stakes of making it so. On June 1948, two soldiers from the 442nd Japanese American Regimental Combat Team, a segregated unit that served in the European theater of World War II and included many recruits from internment camps, were buried in Arlington to wide national press and fanfare. Privates First Class Fumitake Nagato and Saburo Tanamachi had been killed in the Vosges Mountains in France in October 1944 as part of the 442nd's famed rescue of the Lost Battalion. Described in the press as, quote, the first internments of Japanese Americans in the history of the cemetery, the men's joint funeral prompted by their families' next of kin requests was organized by the Department of the Army with assistance from the Japanese American Citizens League. As such, beyond marking the honor due the fallen of the highly decorated combat unit, the funeral became an official post-war assertion of proven Nisei Americanism and a celebration of national inclusivity bolstered by the assimilationist policies of the JACL. These joint efforts were made nationally visible in the funeral itself, which brought together not only the grieving families, members of the Japanese American Citizens League, and the ceremonial acts of the old guard, but also military leaders, 
members of Congress, and other representatives of federal authority, including the honorary pallbearer, Dylan S. Meyer, head of the War Relocation Authority, the office responsible for managing Japanese-American internment. Arlington literally and symbolically provided the grounds for authorizing this particular constellation of post-war Japanese-American citizenship claims. At the funeral, scheduled for the week after Memorial Day, high-ranking military officers acted as pallbearers and speakers, while many of the congressmen, officials, and community leaders invited by the JACL served as honorary pallbearers, offered eulogies, and laid wreaths at the graves. The Army Chief of Chaplains performed the military service, which was followed by a Protestant ceremony in Japanese performed by a minister of Japanese descent. General Jacob L. Devers, Chief of the Army Field Forces, who presented Nagato's mother with a precisely folded, folded flag from her co son's coffin, said of the Nisei men, there is one supreme final test of loyalty to one's native land. This test is readiness and willingness to fight for, and if need be, to die for one's country. These Americans and their fellows passed that test with colors flying. Between his words lay the implication that the will to self-sacrifice and bravery was the test of loyalty for those in whom it could not be presumed because of their race or ethnicity, and that definitive proof came only in death. Representative Ed Gossett of Texas, an honorary pallbearer, similarly argued, they glorified and helped to save American institutions. They also glorified Japanese-American citizenship. Our nation is doubly proud of them. Every account of the men's funeral in the mainstream press identified their participation in the Lost Battalion rescue, but only one made any reference to the histories of internment that shaped their segregated service. Fumitaki Nagato's family had adopted Arlington, Virginia as their home during the war, which meant the Washington Post adopted Nagato as a kind of local son. The paper provided more extensive coverage of his biography and life than others, which noted only the conditions of his, historic, um, his heroic death. 26 years old when he was killed in France, Fumitaki Nagato had been born in Los Angeles County, California, where his parents, quote, ran a farm in the Imperial Valley. The Nagatos had all moved to Arlington in 1943 when they were, again, quote, were evacuated from their West Coast home along with thousands of other Japanese Americans to a relocation center in Arizona before going to Arlington. Employing common euphemisms for eviction, coerced relocation, and incarceration, the Post's description of the family's agricultural past in California running a farm similarly suppressed questions about potential losses of property, about who was now running their farm, in the story of their eastward travels. Fumitaki's surviving siblings were described as thriving and similarly dedicated to the nation. A brother was also in the military, then serving in Korea as part of occupying U.S. forces, a married sister worked at the Treasury Department, and their younger brother, Lincoln, was a student at Thomas Jefferson High School. Saburo Tanamachi held from Texas, like most of the members of the Lost Battalion, he had lost his life saving. While his family did not have an immediate experience of internment, his service in the segregated unit had been defined by it. The story of the Nisei soldier's burial was folded into a developing official narrative of racial inclusivity and democratic promise nurtured in military service and protected by the federal state. This was markedly different from the segregated burials of Arlington's recent past, from the separate and subservient places for non-white people in the nation and its armed forces that were taken for granted in the 1923 funeral of Colonel Charles Young, for instance. Nagato's and Tanamachi's internments 25 years and another world war later were shaped by the particular histories of anti-Asian racism, Japan-U.S. relations, immigration restriction, and wartime incarceration. But they also signaled new federal responses to the untenable contradictions of having fought the good war with a racially segregated military and Cold War assertions that the United States was a beacon for freedom and democracy around the world while so many obviously enjoyed neither within its borders. Arlington became the scene of several high-profile burials of non-white service personnel that enabled a corrective story of progress and democratic social change, while simultaneously asserting that these were already the foundations of American character. The nation's most hallowed ground was recast as a terrain of inclusion and meritocracy distinct from other parts of the country, while exhibiting its true national values. In this official anti-racist story, Arlington was once again the model for the rest of the country on honor, citizenship, and the management of race. <laughs>
The versions of integration and liberal reform promoted at Arlington made clear the narrow parameters of the Cold War state's anti-racism, however. It proffered limited inclusion via military service and sacrifice in order to contain more radical democratic activisms. While this new direction was framed as organic and exceptional to the United States, springing from the hallowed ground within the cemetery's borders, government directives and military pro uh, policy had not prompted it. Rather, assertions of federal anti-racism were largely reactions to ongoing pressure from activists, many of whom were veterans, amplified by Cold War foreign relations concerns and movements for decolonization. Arlington remained a landscape shaped by slavery, however, and its plantation history and segregated graves were persistent reminders on the shaky grounds on which these narratives rested. The summer of 1963 marked a turning point in the cemetery's uses and meanings. With the burial of the assassinated Mississippi NAACP leader Medgar Evers and then of President John F. Kennedy after his own murder. Evers was eligible for an Arlington internment because of his service in World War II and his funeral was transformed into a national memorial for a martyr of the modern African-American civil rights struggle. Distinct from the productive abstractions of the unknown soldier, long framed as the heart of an embodied nation unified through patriotic mourning, the horrific details of Evers' death became in his Arlington rights the basis of calls for moral reckoning, engendering many people hoped a collective national conscience ready for change. It was this version of the nation embodied in the National Cemetery to which Evers' wife, Murley, appealed in her 1967 memoir, For Us, the Living. Likewise, the decision to bury President Kennedy in the cemetery a few months later shifted the emotional registers and memorial function of the cemetery dramatically. Alongside subsequent escalation of the war in Vietnam and intensified anti-war activism, struggles for economic, racial, gender, and sexual justice proliferated within and around the edges of the cemetery in the 1960s and in the 1970s. As a terrain of military death and the nation's most hallowed ground, Arlington authorized powerful moral arguments about the war and about the nation's future from a range of often contradictory perspectives. Although Arlington had only recently been celebrated as iconic of liberal citizenship, American democracy, and the assimilation and integration of diverse populations, it became a staging ground for national debates about the substance and failures of democracy who or what presented the greatest threats to it, and acts of political radicalism. It became a place for questioning the durability of national bonds forged through war and real impacts of liberal reform. Martin Luther King had spoken of these bonds as a hollow and brutal solidarity in his first direct public argument against the Vietnam War in 1967 at an event organized by clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. Describing the war's disproportionate toll on the young men of poor and non-white communities and the gutting of resources for domestic poverty programs, King argued, and so we have been faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. And so we watch them together in brutal solidarity burning the huts of a small village, but we realize they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago. Ten months later, in some defiance of the Army, which had refused permission for a memorial on the grounds that it was a, part a partisan event and a Court of Appeals order upholding the Army's ruling, King led more than 2,000 members of the, organization, uh, the religious organization in a quiet march through Arlington to the foot of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier for a long, silent prayer. The silence was only broken, one reporter noted, by the clicking of heels and sharp commands of the changing of the Army Guard at the tomb above them. I thought of this part of the book quite a bit um, from the moment Kaiser Khan spoke of his son, Colonel Humayun Khan, and described Arlington as a place first that now President-elect Trump needed to look to for sacrifices and asked what his sacrifices had been. Um, but then also, as we continued to see Arlington and, um, and its histories uh, uh, referred to and referenced and lurking around the, the, the political conversation. And I want us to remember Nagato's and Tanamachi's Arlington burials and the assertion that they approve their Americanness and their sacrifice um, because it makes an important historical corollary to, this, um, to our contemporary moment, not only to this political moment, but also to the internment of Japanese Americans in World War II and its political, military, and legal rationales. 
that still haunt the American promise and loom large around calls for the exclusion of Muslims, mass deportations, and greater restrictions on American citizens based on faith and ethnicity in the name of national security. In February 2017, in a few months, the United States will have a new president, does have a new president, and will mark the 75th anniversary of the Executive Order 9066, ordering Japanese American internment. In February, we must reckon as a nation with that act, that act that then looks to this moment in Arlington National Cemetery to make arguments for inclusion and to make arguments for liberal democracy. So when I approached the site and when I approached its history through the prism of politics, the argument is that it's always been a political space and that in making hallowed ground, in making sacred ground of the nation, we are also highlighting some of the most political functions of the country. So I want to end today with a very short um, paragraph from the introduction because it is the one paragraph in the entire book that never got changed. It is what I, I, it, I wrote it as I was initially writing my plans for the book and, um, and it's still here. Although Arlington National Cemetery has more than tripled in size since 1864, it remains a small physical portion of land, less than 700 acres, that is meant to represent the whole of the country and its history. It is intensely managed and constantly changing, but is designed to seem inevitable, uniform, and eternal, producing a version of an enduring America ennobled by sorrow and sacrifice, made strong and heroic through vulnerability, and always triumphant in the face of loss. There is no other place in the United States invested with this particular kind of symbolic weight. But there was nothing inevitable or obvious in this development. And because of this, there is no other terrain so deeply political in its transformations and role in the wider culture. Since before its inception as a cemetery during the Civil War, Arlington has been the place and scene of pitched struggles over the use and shape of the land, struggles that have always been about the larger meanings of freedom, sacrifice, citizenship, honor, state authority, and the nation itself, and about which bodies, alive and dead, are most representative, most capable and valuable, and most difficult to lose. Thanks. I want, to, <clears throat> I want to preface my question by saying uh, I'm a military veteran, um, and um, I'm quite struck by your book and uh, the part that you talk about in terms of its role in kind of forging an image or a, a destiny for a country. Your words are very much better than mine. Okay, but um, I guess I... I I think that's a really the most important part of it. Honoring the people that, that died there, of course, beyond question, they should be honored. But the role of a cemetery, a national cemetery, uh, is, is, is a very interesting concept to me. Uh, as I think about my time in the military and the people I associated with who were gone, and I think about asking, what is the context of um, the cemetery, our cemetery in the United States, vis-a-vis -vis cemeteries in other countries. Mm -hmm. How do they view the importance of their cemetery, pluralism, which you mentioned as one factor, but in terms of the goals of a civilization or a goal of a nation? What comes to mind to me, excuse this rambling question, no. is that years gone by, um, much before my time, the, um, the, f the War Department, the Pentagon was called the War Department. That's been later changed to the Defense Department. Mm -hmm. The change in wording suggests to me that the objective of what the government and what the people of the nation might want. I'm thinking about the same thing perhaps in terms of a 
National Cemetery mm -hmm. in, in terms of a, a containing an image that has a, po a positive ring as, mu as best you can? Mm -hmm. This is, a, this is a, not a very good question, obviously. I mean, because I'm doing all the talking. But I think, I think, I think you, you know where I'm going. I hope you know where I'm going. And maybe you can help me get there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank, and it was a wonderful question. And um, rich with a number of, 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 of important points about the National Cemetery, both the National Cemetery system and then Arlington's place within it. Because, of course, what the National Cemetery system represents fundamentally is the obligations of a nation to the people who wear its uniform and the benefits that are earned through that service and that have been promised in that service. Um, coming out of the Civil War, I think you can think about that set of benefits as pensions and burials. Um, also, it's interesting to think of, of um, the Quartermaster General uh, Montgomery C. Miggs, who's responsible really for the shape of, of, for Arlington National Cemetery being where it is, and then the shape of the cemetery over the 19th century, um, and it is himself um, buried there now. Um, he was also responsible for what is today the, the National Building Museum, but which was the Pension Building. Um, it's his last great project as an architect, um, and it was designed to, to hold the, both the records in a fireproof building, but also the enormous number of people it took to process the growing number of, of, um, of applications and the paperwork for, for pensions. And so what we see in the cemetery, and that I argue in the book, is that we can't lose sight of, of the obligation to veterans that it represents and to the obligation um, to, to honor that service and make good on the benefits that are promised. Um, but then in doing that, it takes on something much greater, particularly at Arlington, as Arlington emerges as the preeminent of the cemeteries, um, which of course, at the time, for, uh, it, it was largely just understood as being local to DC. It took many decades for it to become the site it is now. Um, and in, in, in doing that, um, we also see the ways in which honor and obligation and benefit and earned, earned benefit get shaded with all of these other concerns around citizenship that sets people up in relation to, well, who isn't deserving of benefits, who isn't deserving of honor. Um, and then as we think about it in a wider international context, there are uh, a number of, of, of sites um, across, well, there are a number of sites across the, the, the world and certainly in terms of thinking about Europe and um, uh, a couple in, in Asia in um, uh, sort of the, the extension with the um, American Battle Monuments Commission of overseas cemeteries and the relation of those overseas cemeteries to Arlington and to the, the um, policy of repatriation um, and the, the real um, struggle around the Second World War over whether or not to repatriate all of those um, all of those American bodies, the tomb of the unknown soldier and the burial of the unknown is itself a product of the crisis of how to handle this policy, um, and is, it was marked. Uh, the unknown of the Great War is the only unknown who was repatriated from that war, unlike the wars previous. Um, and so, in thinking about these meanings, um, and in thinking about how a site can can then be turned into the most sacred in the context of a conversation about, about benefits, um, I think it's a, it's, it raises profound questions about democracy, about the liberal state, and about what our responsibilities are, um, and provides a groundwork for negotiating those things. Um, but in doing that, and, and part of what I'm arguing about saying that Arlington is truly our nation's most common ground, I'm not suggesting that only the histories of the military and that only the histories of the bodies that we mark there now encapsulate all of our history, all of the national story. But that if we consider its plantation past, if we consider the struggles of men and women um, of different religions or non-believing of different national origins, gay and lesbian, the variety of people who have sought representation in that place and have, have or have not gotten it, um, then we can see that common ground. And if we can see the fullness of the contests and often the really, um, some of the really horrific and not honorable parts of our past that we also have to reckon with there. You mentioned JFK. Mm -hmm. Is he the only president buried there? Uh, no, uh, Taft is also buried in Arlington. 
Okay. Um, Wilson, many people wanted Wilson to be buried in Arlington, but Wilson is at the National Cathedral. And what was the story about JFK being buried there? Is there a background story? Yes, yes, and, the, and thank you for this question. And JFK's burial at Arlington transforms the cemetery for the nation at large, in part um, through, its t through, it, the, the, um, through the televised funeral, and in part through um, uh, uh, so my apologies. Um, so um, uh, the decision to bury Kennedy in Arlington was a contested one because a number of people assumed that he would be buried in Brookline in the family plot. Um, but uh, because he had expressed his love of the place, and I think a, a number of people may be familiar with the story of um, that actually he shared with a few different people shortly before he was assassinated. Um, he surprised Arlington House National Park Service Rangers one evening by just showing up at Arlington House. And the, the memos are really interesting because the National Park Service was congratulating the young ranger for thinking of talking about Park Service initiatives when he was surprised by the president walking through the front door. Um, and one of the things that he did was he took him through Arlington House on a tour, and then they walked out front to consider the vista. And the vista of DC from the front of Arlington House is one of the most stunning um, scenes of the city that, that uh, one, can, one can have. And actually, it's been the center of tourism t at Arlington uh, from, the very, from the very beginnings, that it was um, urged in the, the early 20th century that Americans should come to Arlington and should stand right in front of Arlington House and look over the city. And in doing that, they would be emboldened in their own patriotism, that you were learning um, your love of nation in that moment. And Kennedy, very famously, shortly before his murder, stood there with this National Park Service um, young ranger and said, it's so beautiful, I could stay here forever. And that moment now has become enshrined in the narrative of locating him in front of Arlington House and locating the, the, the grave site there. Um, uh, the uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, Robert McNamara, at the time is largely credited with urging um, Arlington as the, the, the location for, for the President's burial. The uh, Eternal Flame, um, uh, Jackie Kennedy decided on the Eternal Flame as a part of the component of the site uh, less than 24 hours before the actual burial, and the folks at Arlington achieved that um, flame, although it changed over, over time and, and, and be had a different structure later. Um, and in, in burying Kennedy there and the national televised funeral and those iconic moments of mourning and also the, the, the elements of glamour that attended around those iconic moments of war mourning. I think um, people remember, um, they remember John John saluting, they remember Jackie in, in, in her veil. Um, those are iconic moments in, in, in US, uh, US national culture and memory now. But also it turned the cemetery into a place of mourning for everyone, um, into a place of mourning whether or not you had a specific uh, veteran, a specific family member or friend buried there. Um, the cemetery itself was completely unprepared uh, for the enormous number of visitors that would then come into the cemetery, and it transformed tourism there and responses um, as a public space, just dealing with bathrooms, people moving through, um, but also the numbers of, of, of requests that flooded in from veterans for and their families for burials there, which also the cemetery couldn't handle space-wise. This really sets off what becomes one of the central dynamics up to our immediate moment now of space concerns at the cemetery and the primacy that's now placed on in-ground burials versus inurnments um, in the, the struggle to fit more and more people in the context. And I think um, something we have to remember now uh, in the context of our incredibly long wars and in the context of um, the, the, our, our, our post 9-11 perpetual war state um, that also is a part of this story of how do we deal with um, the, the constraints on, on space. Um, so there was a, the draconian um, limits to who could be buried in Arlington stem from Kennedy's burial and the, the desire. So it actually, so it, it's, it becomes a critical moment in the national history and in the cemetery, but also in terms of the operations of the cemetery that are forever changed from that moment.
Hi. Um, I heard that Meeks is uh, buried there, and I was wondering if you could speak about his memorial and, and also uh, tied in with his wife. Yeah. My, no. my, my question is quite close to that. Oh, okay. If you could sketch the relationship between yeah. Meeks and, and Robert E. Lee yeah. as, you, as you answer his question. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, uh, I, I did, uh, one of my friends here has heard me say this recently, Montgomery Meeks is one of the most fascinating people that I learned much more about in the context of researching this book and was not someone I knew beyond sort of some of the basics of his history um, beforehand. So Miggs, of course, had, had um, worked with Robert E. Lee along on the Mississippi River, had lived with, um, lived with him while he was uh, serving, alongside of, serving alongside him. And um, so I think more than most outside of their circle, understood really what Arlington represented to Robert E. Lee um, and understood what Arlington was to his family and knew full well what it meant to lose it in the context of the war. And um, Miggs had a, a great, um, he was so angry. His level of ire at the kind of, um, at the traitorousness that he saw in his fellow West Point graduates then going to the Confederacy um, and also uh, Jefferson Davis, who as Secretary of War um, had been a long time partner and, and sort of patron of his in, in DC um, to, uh, to then turn to the Confederacy himself and lead the Confederacy as its president um, at one point in his, in his journals. And, and Miggs's journals are, they're a wonderful read. He is such a, a poetic writer in short, um, but of course, thankfully, the shorthand has been translated, but they were all also in shorthand that was almost unreadable, and his handwriting is almost unreadable. But now, um, some very, very skilled and wonderful people have given us all the gift of uh, a transcript instead of uh, having to read it on the page. Um, but he he wrote of, of of he was actually at home when Union troops went down his street as they were headed toward the occupation of of Arlington and Alexandria, and he said later, contemplating that moment, you know, what did Davis and the others have to answer for? I mean, so, um, and that they had too much, you know, they couldn't answer for what they were doing. Uh, so over time, um, he, he already understood the site as, as a challenge to Lee and as a challenge to all of these people who had, um, uh, uh, for their acts and for joining the Confederacy. But also then once his son, John, um, was killed in the war, later in the war, his son had been at First Bull Run, and then Miggs convinced him to go back to West Point and finish his education and not stay. Um, and then in 1864, he was working as an aide to Sheridan and was killed in, 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 in that campaign. Um, Miggs always believed that he had been murdered, that the, the act of his death was not a, a, a viable, was not a legal act of war, um, and tried to pursue murder charges for his death. Um, but when he was buried, he was buried in Georgetown in the family plot alongside two Miggs infants who um, had, had died much earlier. It was when Louisa, Miggs' wife, w died that he already understood by that time what the cemetery meant to him and to other people in the army as he was developing it. He had her buried in Arlington and had John and the infants and several Rogers, um, uh, Louisa's family were the, the Rogers, uh, uh, Navy family, and had them reinterred in Arlington um, where he is buried now too. And so his tomb, and this was, I, from start to finish, makes this a fascinating person. Um, he doesn't seem like a very fun person. I don't think you'd want to hang out with him, but he is a fascinating person. Uh, but from the, the at his will describes um, that he wants to be laid to rest in the tomb that's already been set, that, that Louisa is in. They, they share the tomb together. John, in one of the most, I think, affecting um, monuments in, in the cemetery, John is buried beside them, but his tomb is, is, is very, it's small, and on top of it is a base relief of what he looked like when they found him in the road dead. And, but he is also, uh, it is, he, he's beatific, and he's beautiful, he's forever young. Um, he was handsome in life, but he's, it, it is a, a, a sad, lovely representation, and he's always tiny next to this enormous tomb. Um, in Miggs's will, he had a paragraph that was 
12 lines long describing the kind of cement mix they needed to seal the top of the tomb, how it should be set. He was an architect to the end, and then he said, seal it up and let me await the resurrection. But he, he managed it right till the final moment. Um, in, well, she, there, there's a narrative about her and her family on the side. The tomb itself is fairly classic and, and um, uh, austere. It doesn't, have, it doesn't have much decoration to it. But I might be misunderstanding the question. That was the son John. Yeah, so L Louisa died shortly, not much longer after the war. She died very young of, of, of illness. But yes, the, that's the son's tomb, and it is, I, it is undeniably affecting in, in pictures and in person and really profound. And someone recently asked me if there were sculptural representations of grieving parents in the cemetery like, um, then they sent me several in Germany that are a part of um, both uh, a national cemetery in Germany and then another site in Berlin. And there isn't that kind of representation that is the physical body of parents grieving, but Miggs's tomb, the, the, the parents next to John's, is, is surely um, a, a similar representation and was a, a it's a lovely and affecting, but, um, uh, uh, deeply sad representation of that kind of that kind of loss, and they they were devastated. I mean, in the 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 archives of their um, Migs's archive is full of pictures of his son and 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 narratives about about, about his loss. It's, yeah. Um, the first question you can answer me later. When I was a student at the Yale School of Public Health in the 60s, there was a Professor Montgomery Meigs there at the time. Is that is that? Yeah. There's a Montgomery C. Meigs in every generation. Many okay. of them are also generals. Okay, because he was environmental health. I never had him for, he was kind of an austere character <laughs> at, at that time. Um, when you go to Arlington, the graves well, first of all, who gets a tomb and, and who pays for it, and historically. And then the other thing that now, the, the graves were simple stones with simple military, I don't even remember if they had their decorations on going back, but they do now. Now it seems, and the ministers in the audience, uh, pardon me, that every American Protestant sect has got their emblem, and unless you're into that game, you have no idea what they mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. And it, it's sort of nice that we were all the same without a religious connotation on every grave. What's the history of that? The original headboards, um, thank you for the, the question. The original headboards, because most of the Union soldiers who, and some Confederate soldiers who were buried in Arlington were disinterred from places all over Maryland and Virginia and brought to Arlington. And so part of the dynamic um, that I'm describing of, of making hallowed ground, it, it wasn't, it was a, a, a scene of, of a variety of struggles and battles of the Civil War, but it was not a battlefield. It's not as, as Lincoln stood at Gettysburg and said, you know, we can't we can't um, consecrate, we can't make this place hallowed. What they did here made it hallowed, which of course, as Lincoln says that, and across history he is making it hallowed ground. But um, what you see in, in Arlington is the inverse of that, is actually the bringing of bodies that died elsewhere to Arlington that starts the process of hallowing. And Miggs himself, who designed the, the, the tomb of the unknown, um, the tomb of the unknowns of the Civil War, the, the inscription actually really, um, highlights and memorializes the act of collecting and marking and, and the, the act of, 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 um, uh, of creating that hallowed ground, of the bureaucracy that it takes to create that hallowed ground. Um, so originally, the headboards were wooden, and they identified the space from where the bodies had been disinterred, oftentimes in hoping that they would be able, particularly with the many unknowns, to figure out who they were um, over time. And so you would get, um, uh, you would have documentation. There was documentation of, of the, the original grave site and then the numbered place in, in Arlington. But as you get the representations over time, first of um, uh, 
first as uh, Christians or Jews, and then an expansive, um, an expansive marking of, of religious denotations. Most of those come from um, service personnel themselves who have to demand representation and demand recognition over time. And I'm, I can tell you afterwards the exact number that we're at now. Most recently, um, uh, the, the pentagram for Wiccan service personnel um, under the Bush administration was, was finally sort of a, a allowed um, into place because they dropped, they, they stopped fighting the lawsuits. Um, and uh, it's interesting to consider also these markers on the graves themselves as opposed to um, chaplains and dog tags and Wiccan service personnel had already been recognized by, by the chaplain service and, and on um, other military documentation, but the headstones themselves were, um, were, took a longer time to shift. And so a number of people urge looking to that place, and this I think we saw with the, with the Khan family, or we saw uh, in 2008 with um, uh, General Colin Powell referencing a, a different Khan family and a different uh, Muslim American serviceman buried at Arlington as, as, a, as a, a representation of a diverse nation and as a counter to the Islamophobia. The individual veterans and their families that wanted to be identified with their, with their faith. Um, you know, it's, it's, and I would have to, I don't have the exact year to offer you right now. Um, but uh, it, as you have the replacement with um, the, 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 permanent, the permanent headstones, it becomes a part. It is the only thing other than rank and area of service and, and death and birth dates and name that are allowed, um, which has been a struggle in Section 60 as people wanted to, to, to add their own sort of relationship to their, their lost um, loved one or friend. Uh, and the, the cemetery has, has, has really struggled with a policy for how to deal with both decorations and things that have been affixed to the headstones themselves. But that, that religious marker has, has um, I can't give you the exact year when it starts, but it's been there for a very long time. Well, officers can have individual headstones. They can have headstones that aren't the official um, regulation headstone that you're talking about, which I think it's also very interesting to consider that, and you can sort of look at the cover of the book, the image that designs the cover, that that when we think of, of, of Arlington also as a place of, of sort of a leveling place, right? That, that, um, that people are common in their sacrifice and it doesn't matter where you came from or what you had, you shared this, this stone. And the, the also thinking about just the epic representation of loss in looking at row after row after row of the same, of the same stone. But then as you move through section one or as you move around the edges of section 60, a more, you know, the, an incredibly active site within the cemetery, um, officers can have individually chosen um, larger or, or um, other kinds of, of stones, although there have been moments where um, the, the cemetery resisted certain decorations that they found not fitting with, with the overall, um, what, they were, what they were hoping to achieve, largely. It's, it's been a constant, it's been a constant struggle. Um, and then you also have in various sections where you have extraordinary um, people who are there under sort of extraordinary service uh, uh, after many of the, the limitations. Um, there are certain areas that you see are, are more larger monuments. We have time for one more question. Where, where, do, where do they go to expand? That's the question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so over time you have something that started as 200 acres. That was the, the original designation for the cemetery. Um, and I mentioned Freedman's Village, the, the um, contraband camp that was established there that also after the Civil War and after resisting initial attempts by the, the War Department to disband the village completely became a far more expansive site and became a site of individual, um, individually designated and rented plots around the Arlington Plantation. And so by the end of the 19th century, you have 200 acres of cemetery around Arlington House, and then you have hundreds of acres of farmland being farmed by Freedmen's Villagers or their descendants um, who it were uh, who born and raised there that virtually surrounds the cemetery then right up to, to Fort Myer, which is also on um, Arlington, uh, the original Arlington Plantation um, acreage. 
when Freedman's Village is finally uh, evicted and disbanded around 1890, an extra 124 acres are added to the cemetery. And that sort of starts this moment of at, 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 at uh, uh, critical junctures expanding into different, different pieces until we get up to the almost 700 acres today. One of the arguments, many of y'all are familiar, I assume, with the, um, the, the visitor center as you walk in. And the visitor center, as you move in the main entrance next to that large parking deck, which came a little bit later, the visitor center was dedicated in the early 1980s. Um, one of the ways that they, the, the cemetery sold the budget, the need for appropriations for that visitor center, uh, was talking about the, the amount of acreage that would be freed up in producing it for new graves, that it was, it was a, a constant calculus of how to, how to fit in extra, extra spaces. Um, and the visitor center made permanent what had been temporary after Kennedy's burial, when they had to quickly put up public bathrooms and, and some other things for, for the number of people. What I, yeah, actually, what I'm, I'm suggesting, and I do suggest at the end of the book, that we need to figure out what happens. I mean, currently, um, cemetery officials have said that, that, you know, we have a few decades left of, of, of burials in the available land now. Um, and it's not, that's a congested urban area. That's not changing. Uh, back in the 90s, there were calls from some to, to turn Arlington into a historic cemetery and not an active cemetery um, that were, that fairly quickly was pushed back against and dropped out of the conversation. But I do think that, that we will see those calls reemerge. Um, one of the things that, that's happened is, is that the, uh, the um, Veterans Affairs announced a, and, and the Cemeterial Administration announced a vast expansion of the national system that's underway right now. And they, they announced it last summer as the largest expansion since the Civil War. That this is, and part of this is about trying to achieve um, uh, by the time it's done, if it, if, it, if it reaches its full sort of planned um, uh, uh, vision, every single veteran in the United States will live within 75 miles of a national cemetery and, and their families. And so it's the, the, there had been a dream for a long time to have a national cemetery in every state and several. Um, this comes close to achieving that, but it's also a part of trying to relieve some of the pressure from places like Arlington. And so I think... Um, there is a there is a, a new expansion piece that is is um, currently underway and a, an enormous expansion of inurnments and the columbarium there, which also will be. The yeah, um, and the woods behind Arlington House have have constantly been a source of struggle. They're historic woods that date back to George Washington Park Custis, um, but there have been various moments where the cemetery wanted to expand into those into those woods. Um, Metzler Sr., who was superintendent of the cemetery when uh, Kennedy, uh, he oversaw Kennedy's burial, um, but his son, Metzler Jr., who was, was um, more recently uh, the, the superintendent and actually grew up in the cemetery, both struggled over that land um, behind, behind Arlington House. Thanks so much for oh. coming out, everyone. Um, books will be sold behind the cash register, and Dr. Macklier will be signing. Thank you so much.